Marissa, thank you so much. Um, Pacific Council members and guests, I am delighted uh, to welcome a, a, a very distinguished guest, uh, Vice Admiral uh, Linda L. Fagan, who is the commander of the Pacific area and commander of Coast Guard Defense Forces West. Um, and she has uh, uh, served for um, her pr entire professional career since leaving the Coast Guard Academy um, as, as, as a member of the Coast Guard. Um, Vice Admiral Fagan assumed command of the Coast Guard Pacific area in June 2018, where she serves as the operational commander for all US Coast Guard missions from the Rocky Mountains to the waters off the East Coast of Africa. I, I, just, I, was, I, I just want everybody to imagine, this is from Denver all the way to I, you know, Mumbai or even west of Mumbai, I guess all the way to, to, to Kenya, to Kenya. So the coast of Tanzania and Kenya. So she has responsibility for 40% of the, you know, of, of, of the planet, or I, I can't, I can't count that high, but it's an extraordinary responsibility. Um, she concurrently serves as commander of Defense Forces West, provides Coast Guard mission support to the Department of Defense and combatant commanders, which again, I'm going to, you, you, I'm going to ask the Admiral to explain, you know, that relationship because the Coast Guard is, 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 uh, not in the Pentagon, it's in the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and finally, she's the Coast Guard's first ever gold ancient trident, um, the officer with the longest service record in the marine safety field. And safety in her profession is, you know, you gotta wear seat belts, but it's a, it's, it's a, it's a huge responsibility with the numbers of people and resources and so forth. So I wanna welcome you, Admiral Fagan. I, I'm sure you get this question all the time. Could you just, you know, the short version, tell our members, you know, about the Coast Guard and how it differs from, you know, what they may be thinking? Yeah. Hey, hey, thanks, Jerry. And uh, really appreciate the uh, opportunity to spend a little bit of time uh, with everyone uh, uh, talking about the Coast Guard. I uh, obviously, as you say, they, uh, this is uh, it's, it's been my job, my profession, my lifestyle for really my entire uh, adult life. And I, uh, I consider myself really fortunate to uh, have found myself. Uh, in this just really incredible organization. Um, it's a family affair for me. My youngest daughter is also uh, in. I think it just speaks to, uh, to the service and what we uh, offer from an opportunity standpoint for, uh, for our workforce. So, hey, one of the things that I've learned, and uh, you know, I've, I've worked quite a bit with my DOD counterparts, and I had time at Northcom uh, you know, in, a, in a joint tour, and invariably the DOD guys will say, oh, yeah, yeah, the Coast Guard, we know what you do. And then I start talking about what we do and they go, oh, we had no idea. We didn't know you did that. So the way I like to you know, kind of characterize who and what we are as an organization, and I think the, the first point of clarity and where, where people get confused, first off, we are a military service. We're one of the branches of the military in the United States. My ID card looks like you know, my, an army counterpart's ID card, they're identical. Uh, so that confuses people that somehow we may not be a military service. We absolutely are. Uh, however, we, we do not reside within the Department of Defense. We, uh, we work uh, for the Department of Homeland Security. And when the Homeland Security Department was stood up, we were one of the operating agencies uh, that came over to help uh, form the new department. Prior to that, we were in uh, transportation under the Department of Transportation. One of the unique things too about the Coast Guard is we, we like to talk about our 11 statutory missions, but really what I'd like for you to take away is uh, sort of the, the multi, multiplicity of authorities that the Coast Guard uh, has, and uh, it allows us to, to be incredibly nimble with the resources that we have. And so, so for example, we have Title 10 authorities, which is you know, what our uh, military counterparts have. We have Title 14 authorities. You can get just into law enforcement, uh, regulatory authorities. Uh, you know, and, and we talked about the safety mission that we have. Um, and then we are a member of the intelligence community, and so we have Title, uh, title 50 authorities. And the unique thing is that those authorities reside uh, in our individuals and in our units sort of um, mostly at all times simultaneously. And so, we'll, you know, we're going to unpack quite a bit here on IEU fishing, but so I'll use for an example, um, a couple of months ago, we had a uh, request from, uh, from Ecuador for some assistance with uh, Chinese incursions into uh, their EEZ uh, off the Galapagos. And um, the ship that we ended up using to counter that threat 
had been deployed into the Eastern Pacific and was, was conducting counter-narcotics uh, operations. We didn't have to do anything different. All of the authority and the skill and the ability uh, to generate presence and conduct fisheries boardings was, was resident in that, in that ship. And so we were just able to, to you know, kind of move her physically uh, in position to then conduct boardings and, uh, and, and counter that presence. Um, it is a, it, that's a flexibility and nimbleness that uh, I don't take for granted and uh, I think really drives the, uh, the value proposition and the return on investment that, uh, that your Coast Guard uh, provides to, uh, to, to the citizens and to the Homeland Security equation. Thanks. You know, if the Coast Guard really is, I'm going to sound like an infomercial, but I was telling the Admiral, we have a long, deep relationship with the Coast Guard, which we, um, which we really value. Um, and it really is the indispensable service because um, the Admiral can talk about collaborating with the Navy or the Department or, or DEA or, you know, every government organization has some crossover with the Coast Guard in a way that's um, different with, you know, with the Navy and the Marines and the Army and the Air Force and so forth. So that special mission is, is important. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal where the Admiral was, was interviewed. It's called U.S. Deploys Coast Guard Far From Home to Counter China. And it was an extremely informative, interesting article because, you know, when you read the coast part of Coast Guard, it suggests that they operate off, you know, Nantucket, Massachusetts or something. The Coast Guard indeed has become a global force, and I uh, not only force, but 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 uh, representative of the U.S. government. And I wondered, Admiral, if you could tell us a little bit about this transition. When you went to the Coast Guard Academy, I suspect the Coast Guard was a very different organization than it is now. And if someone told you this was what you would be doing, you you probably would have been astounded. So, how does that work? Yeah, so if somebody told me when uh, I was a newly commissioned uh, ensign back in the mid 80s that I would find myself, well, one, still serving and in the position I am, and then, uh, you know, having the unique opportunity to uh, have a bilateral Coast Guard to Coast Guard exchange with my Chinese counterpart in Russia and vice versa, the Russian counterpart in China, I would have said, oh, no way. And of course, you know, we weren't even talking about uh, China back, uh, back in, in those, those days. Uh, you know, we are a we are a global force, right? And um, we have always had a security and maritime security as part of our um, mission and remit. And it might uh, be useful just a you know a little bit of kind of historical context on uh, what and how the Coast Guard came came into being. So we you know we trace our roots back to 1790 and the Revenue Cutter Service. So Alexander Hamilton signs into law, you know that. Uh, a few cutters may prove to be useful sentinels of the law as the new nation needed to generate uh, tax revenue to, uh, to, to support the, you know, young and, and growing country. And then, you know, so then there's the lighthouse uh, establishment and the life-saving service and steamboat service. All of those uh, independent entities are brought together uh, into what we now call the modern day Coast Guard. And so the authorities that I talked about came with each of those agencies and, and have been uh, been retained by us. And so, you know, well, we've got jurisdiction over all of the navigable U.S. waters, the Western rivers, and in our EEZs, we also have extraterritorial authority. And that's where you see uh, our ability to operate and create maritime presence uh, globally. So homeland security is not a home game when you do it well, right? Homeland security is an away game. And uh, Coast Guard ships and, and the cutters that we have deployed into the, in the Western Pacific, you know, I was talking about in the Wall Street Journal article, um, enable that away game in a way that our Navy counterparts uh, are unable to do. You know, the Navy is creating lethality and presence and countering uh, direct, you know, kind of def defense uh, threats to the to the homeland. We we offer a value proposition that's about partnership and capacity building, uh, creating uh, you know basically good governance, rule of law, exhibiting the kinds of um, you know behaviors from from a value proposition that we'd like to see um, from you know all of the nations uh, in in the region. I think probably the biggest. Well, one of the things that's changed, some things have changed, some things have not changed in the 35 years I've been in uniform. So my first unit was the Polar Star. Polar Star is still in commission. 
and it was a it was an aging chip then she was commissioned in 76 in fact i woke up this morning to see polar star off the uh off the the point where uh where my house is and so she's still in commission but uh here in another couple of weeks we will decommission the last of the 378s the 378s were um, high endurance cutters they were the uh, backbone of the fleet when I was commissioned as an officer, and we will decommission the last one of those here next month. And they've been replaced by national security cutters that um, bring a, a capacity and a capability suite into the organization that we have never had before. They are absolutely game changing, particularly when we talk about this sort of the, the global uh, projection and deployment. And so you know, in the Wall Street Journal article, I talk about the Stratton deployment where we were helping to enforce UN sanction uh, work against uh, the North Koreans and the illegal uh, transfer of oil. In fact, if uh, if any of you have New York Times subscription over the weekend, I think it was either Sunday or Monday, the New York Times has a video, uh, info video, it's about 10 minutes that walks through the network that allows those illegal uh, activities to uh, to happen. But after that, the Stratton did a Taiwan Straits transit, first time ever. Then, you know, it goes over and they're operating with the Malaysians, Chinese, um, you know, Bakamla in Indonesia, and, you know, a whole suite of, you know, Pacific Island nations and countries who have, you know, Coast Guards and navies uh, who, who are, are, are peers and welcome and seek those opportunities to, to operate alongside of us. We, we grow as an organization, we're able to do it, and the intent is to increase uh, their capacity and professionalism to uh, to to do the the same, and then oh by the way, then we're you know we're we're steaming uh, with the Navy whether it's RIMPAC or uh, or otherwise, and I think again it just reflects the uh, sort of nimbleness and fluidity that um, uh, the skill set and the professionalism that the U.S. Coast Guard brings uh, brings to the mission. Thanks. Uh, let me ask a question um, focused on the report, um, which is. A, a new strategy to, to combat illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, IUUF. Uh, and the Coast Guard released this report. The Admiral referenced this experience in Ecuador, um, which in which um, ch illegal Chinese fishing boats protected, I think, by the Chinese Coast Guard, I think, was harassing, you know, the government of Ecuador and chasing away other fisher Fisher, uh, fisher, fishing boats and uh, vessels and so forth. So that this is not simply about ichthyology. I mean, this is one, this is another flavor uh, of, of, of geopolitics. And it's also not, I, I just read another piece because uh, I've been reading up in preparation for today that, 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 that I'm going to get the terminology wrong, but deep water, um, underwater trolling for fish where they just dig up the whole bottom of the ocean unleashes as much carbon as flying. So there's a global warming, climate change piece of this, which I never imagined existed. So this, this IUUF report that the Coast Guard did really goes well beyond simply fishing, which in itself is important, but this is, you know, this is where the rubber hits the road uh, geopolitically. And um, it's a global, phenomenon. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about it. Who, By the way, I commend the report to everybody. Uh, we, we have a link to it on our, on our website. It's really, really interesting. And frankly, the pictures are fascinating because it shows the Coast Guard operating globally. So if you could give us some context, uh, we would appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks. I appreciate that, right? I mean, this IUUF is global in its scope and its impact. And that's, that's one of the challenges. You know, the other thing, um, and, you know, we talked about my AOR, there is a lot of water out there, right? 74 million square miles of ocean that I've got in my, my AOR. And so uh, one of the challenges is, right, you know, uh, virtual presence is actual absence on the water. So, uh, you know, when, when you've got a, a distant uh, fleet like the Chinese and Taiwan and others are operating, you need to generate physical presence to begin to counter some of that uh, illegal uh, act activity. Um, and the, you know, the, the intent on the strategy is, um, you know, to kind of to bring some focus to this worldwide issue, um, you know, by the Coast Guard. And you know, we've been we've been enforcing living marine resources laws for a long, long time as a, you know, as the, the maritime agency 
uh, in the in the U.S. And so bringing some clarity uh, to that, uh, the commandant felt was really important. One of the things that was interesting when we rolled that strategy out last fall, if you saw the press conference or any of the coverage, it was Admiral Schultz, commandant of the Coast Guard, standing next to Admiral Fowler, the Southcom commander, the combatant commander uh, for Southcom, talking about how disruptive uh, IUU fishing is. Uh, you know, from um, uh, just you know the countering a network and, and illegal activity. This is the first time I've heard any of my DoD counterparts talk about fish, and they've definitely we, they've you know we, we've got their attention as well. And um, you know it it is going to you know take kind of a whole of government uh, you know broad partnership cooperative effort to really begin to you know, affect some change and counter uh, the level of uh, activity that's, that's going on. Um, and so some of this is, you know, illum first step is just illuminating the network to understand uh, where the phishing is going on and what some of the upstream uh, pieces uh, are. And, and the intent on the strategy is to, again, you know, help kind of bring some, some focus uh, a unity of effort across not just the U.S. government, but uh, but our uh, international international partners as well. Thanks. Are there regions of the world that are particularly uh, impacted by IUUF? Are there countries that are particularly bad actors? If you look at the, I mean, you would know this, Admiral, but everybody, take a look at the map. Look where China is. Look where the Galapagos is. Um, it's, it's it's quite a distance. And um, this doesn't respect territoriality. So, are there particular regions, and are there particular countries that are, you know, that are, sorry, that are responsible for this? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the reality is, right? Those fleets follow the fish. So the and and depending on the stock, the um, the incursion and activity can look and feel a little bit different. So, pertaining to the you know, Galapagos and the EEZ, right? That's a squid fishery. We're watching, and so it's primarily China. China and Taiwan are some of the, the worst offenders from the fishing fleet. There's Global Fish Watch. There's all kinds of, you know, open source on kind of the top top five offenders and um, uh, what what is going on there. So, you know, we're, we're watching the Chinese fleet now. The squid aren't near the EEZ right now, right? So you don't have that pressure in has to do with water temperature. There's obviously a lot of changing patterns um, in ocean temperature that are uh, kind of disrupting uh, some of the, uh, you know, some of what would have been a very seasonal and predictable uh, pattern on some of these fisheries. So, um, you know, so that's the, the squid uh, issue off of uh, the Galapagos. We, um, we, the Coast Guard, um, you know, uh, watch our maritime boundary line between us and Russia. Uh, to ensure there's no incursions there. You know, back in the 70s, there were regularly incursions by the Russians into uh, our EZs for, for fish. Um, and so that it just, you know, it really, you can, you can spotlight around, uh, around the globe and, you know, kind of look at who's going after fish and, and what, uh, what those, those threat vectors are. From a, from a risk, I, you know, the, um, for, for many of the world's populations, like 3.3 billion people rely on fish for their annual protein, right? So this is, this is not just about, you know, sort of theft of a natural resource. It's, it's about economic security, food security, and just, you know, national sovereignty for many nations, particularly some of the smaller Pacific uh, island nations. And, um, you know, to where I started, you've got to generate uh, presence and so, um, you know, one of the things that uh, that that we've done really, really effectively in the counter narcotics mission is um, uh, establishing bilateral agreements with countries that allow us to work cooperatively. We're we're working and expanding those to include fish in areas. So I'm I'm going to use uh, Fiji as an example in the uh, in the in the fisheries uh, realm. So we've got a bilateral with Fiji uh, that allows a Fijian ship rider to come on. Uh, to a U.S. Coast Guard ship, so we, you know, we've got the platform, all of the ability to to project into the into the waters, and then the the Fijian Coast Guard member brings their authorities and ability to enforce uh, their laws and you know um, to counter illegal activity in fish, and it's just it's a great uh, great union and and way to uh, begin to to bring together uh, presence and capabilities and authorities. 
you know, against a particularly challenging network and, and series of activities made most difficult by just the amount of water out there. It's just a big time distance problem as well. Who are our closest allies and partners working on these global maritime security issues? I mean, the, 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 does the United Kingdom have a globally deployed Coast Guard? I, I you know, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know, you know, who your, your peers and partners are in a lot of countries, because this is a prime example of the importance, A, of U.S. global leadership and B, U.S. global alliances. These are really, really important examples. We can't do this alone, but we do need to lead, in my view. So I'm curious, who do we, who, you know, when you get the phone rings and somebody says, ma'am, it's Admiral so-and-so from such and so, and you say, oh, good, it's good to hear from, you know, my yeah. counterpart or wherever. Yes. So one of the interesting things um, you know, about the U.S. Coast Guard and what we find as we operate around the world, um, we, many nations' navies are actually more akin or aligned to us than they are to the U.S. Navy just because of the way they've been put together. The other reality for us as a U.S. Coast Guard is the the, the number of authorities and missions that, that we oversee. So, you know, so for example, we're, we're the flag state authority. We, we inspect and certificate uh, vessels. We, you know, do those LMR boardings for our own fishing fleet. We license mariners. Um, you know, we do ports and waterways security patrols in the harbors, you know, kind of list all those. Most other nations, you deal with two, and it's usually three different organizations to, to you know, encapsulate the full breadth of, uh, of, of what we've got. So it's just, that's kind of an important point, because again, this just gets to the nimbleness and our ability to operate. So our, you know, our big, and so many nations specifically limit their Coast Guards from, you know, operating far farther afield. And so I think that, you know, that's the case in the, in the UK. Um, I'm gonna speak more to the Pacific side because I'm, you know, really familiar with our, our key partners and engagements there. And I would start with Canada and the Canadian Navy. Um, you know, Canada is, uh, they're, they've been absolutely key critical partners in our counter narcotics fight. There, there are a couple of Canadian vessels uh, down there in the, uh, the transit and arrival zone as we speak, um, you know, boarding and fishing vessel looking for uh, illicit activities. Um, you know, Japan and Korean Coast Guard are absolutely uh, critical partners. And, you know, we've had longstanding uh, relationships with Japan and, uh, and Korea. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with the Indonesians and helping uh, them stand up Bakamla, and they're talking about Coast Guard Academy, just a lot of uh, engagement there. So I, I'm a little embarrassed to say I kind of discovery learned in this job about um, two countries whose navies and Coast Guards are absolutely peers of ours, and that's the Malaysian, particularly the Malaysian Navy, very, very sophisticated professional uh, set of mariners in India. Um, and so th those are kind of, those are our, our peer key partners uh, throughout the region. Uh, and, and then I would include, uh, you know, Australia and New Zealand as well. And I, these are all commanders who I've reached out to in the last year during COVID. We've done it, you know, virtually as opposed to traveling, but um, uh, absolutely key partners to engagement. And then as you look around Oceania and the region, you know, we seek opportunities, whether it's, you know, in in Palau or in Papua New Guinea or, you know, places where um, a training team or just some, um, you know, a communications exercise uh, or some just interoperating will provide great benefit for, uh, for those Coast Guards. And we, we actively look and seek for those opportunities because this is about, you know, it's about a building capacity of our, of our both, you know, in operating with our peers, building capacity of partner nations and, and kind of bringing um, you know, net, we talk about it takes a network to defeat a network. We're going to continue to invest and build in the network to allow us to get after this uh, this threat and risk. That's a really good segue into one other topic I wanted to raise, which is the Arctic, which is generally synonymous um, with with the Coast Guard. Um, you know, the Russians are, are are deeply engaged. China has interests uh, in in. In the Arctic, um, how what, what are the primary issues um, in the Arctic, and 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 are we you know adequately resourced 
uh, to deal with them to your to your satisfaction. Yeah. So um, we obviously we're spending you know a lot of time and and attention uh, on on the Arctic and um, you know I mentioned the Polar Star right. Uh, she was commissioned in 1976. Uh, that is the nation's currently only heavy icebreaker uh, in commission. So the good news is, though, you know, the the nation has committed to to building. We've uh, we're we're about to cut steel on the first one, and there's money for long lead material for the second polar security cutter. Uh, they're going to be built uh, by halter down on the Gulf Coast, and um, it's a joint Navy Coast Guard uh, acquisition and program office that are uh, you know getting getting those ships built, but they will be commissioned and operated as uh, as Coast Guard cutters. And you'll note. They're polar security cutters. It's not an icebreaker. I mean, they're going to be very capable icebreakers, but it's an acknowledgement of the, again, presence and sovereignty in what I'll call the, the Western Arctic, right? The Alaska Arctic, where you know, we are an Arctic nation. We've got an EEZ and um, uh, you know, need to have the ability to you know, project our sovereignty into our uh, space in the, in the Arctic. Um, but the Arctic, just like in the IE fishing, right there, it's you've got the Arctic Council, you've got a number of Arctic nations who, um, you know, collectively share, uh, you know, the view on the Arctic and you know, the need for, um, you know, free and open uh, availability to the to the space. And so, you know, we spent a lot of time then, my counterpart on the East Coast, the land area commander, a lot of time with those partnerships and engagements, you know, Den Denmark. Uh, Iceland and all you know all of the the Arctic uh, nations nations there. So you know China declared themselves as a uh, as a near Arctic nation. I don't know what that means. That's not actually a term of art in the uh, in the law of the sea or any of the other uh, conventions. It's definitely uh, something that we continue to uh, watch. I you know the the Chinese um, desires for for access and influence in the Arctic uh, are just are something we, we should be concerned with as a nation and need to continue to, to monitor. Um, you can't talk about the Arctic though without talking about uh, Russia and their northern sea route, which um, you know it, it, for them the the ability to exploit their natural resources up there and the, the revenue that it generates just kind of I mean I it it does feel a little bit different. It's a little bit existential for the Russians, right? They 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 need to generate that revenue just to provide for their own um, people. It again something that we definitely um, are uh, are are watching. So the the Russian border guard is our counterpart on uh, on the Russian side, and so you know my uh, district commander up in uh, up in Alaska, he's homeported in Juneau, and uh, his Russian border guard counterpart is in uh, I think he's in Kamchatka. Uh, they have almost daily interactions, right? So the 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 the, sh the view on the maritime boundary line between the two countries, our ability to uh, you know uh, communicate from a search and rescue standpoint, and just you know know where each other is, has actually been been pretty good. Uh, I will point out though, we uh, the Polar Star uh, did an Arctic West winter. She just uh, she got back into Seattle a month and a half ago or so, and um, so we had her we had her up almost to seventy degrees. Uh, you know, like in January, and uh, I do not think the Russians expected to see us up there that far north that time of year. We definitely uh, we ended we surprised them. I think a lot there was a fair number of communications between a couple of their ships and um, and aircraft. But uh, again, you know, actual presence and and creating that uh, that that sovereignty and our ability to to you know create kind of enduring on the water uh, commitment into the Arctic is going to be important and. Uh, and as these polar security cutters, you know, as I say, we're starting to get them built and we're going to get them into commission. I think we get the first one uh, like late 2024 and we couldn't be more, more excited about it. Thanks. Let me ask, uh, I want to shift a little bit. Um, we, we have a, the Pacific Council has a relationship with, with LC Wins, a group called LC Wins. I'm not sure if you're from, it's the Leadership Council for Women and National Security. And recently um, we had a member of their board, retired uh, General Lori Robinson, speak who was who was an air force four star and i pointed out to her it's easier to become a member of the uh, los angeles lakers than it is to become a general officer um you're a woman there just aren't a whole lot of you 
And um, are you, uh, is, is it, I, again, I should know this, are you the highest ranking woman in the history of the Coast Guard? Has there ever been a woman commandant? Um, will you be the first, well, that's, I shouldn't ask that quite that. <laughs> uh, um, okay, so, you yeah. Could, you know, talk a little bit about the role of women in the Coast Guard, I would appreciate it. So, and I know I, I did not serve with General Robinson. She uh, she arrived at NORTHCOM uh, after, after I left, but, um, I, you can go on a Wikipedia and Google, you know, four star females across all of the uh, services. I, I don't think there's even been 20. That's, you know, Army, Navy, everybody. So in the Coast Guard, so you know, I am currently the senior woman on active duty. Uh, we've had a number of other uh, women raised to the, the three star uh, rank. I think I'm the, I'm the fifth. And several, um, you know, Viv Vivian Cray, uh, retired as a three-star as a, as vice commandant, uh, Sally Bryce O'Hara, same, uh, same thing. And then, you know, uh, Jody, Jody Breckenridge retired, uh, out of the job I'm currently in and, uh, and Sandy Stowes, who was a first female superintendent at the Academy and then, um, uh, retired as our, our head of mission support. And so I, you know, it's interesting. I've, I've been doing a lot of the women's leadership, uh, Talk and we did one. We did a mother daughter one, which was actually kind of fun. And so uh, the first question was, well, what about you know, kind of uh, mentoring? And so my daughter answered the question first, and she goes, she says, you know, I I look around and there there are just a ton of women across the ranks. I don't even think she says, I don't even think about it. I don't know a time uh, when we didn't have uh, women serving across the ranks, including you know, in senior roles like the one that that I'm in right now. Uh, that was not true for me when I graduated from the academy uh, in the 80s, and, and many of the women that I've uh, just mentioned who were senior to me. But I mean, it was literally onesie, uh, twosies. And so uh, we have come, we've come a long ways as a service, uh, as a you know, as a country, as a Coast Guard. the The Coast Guard Academy is graduating nearly 40 percent women. Uh, my class graduated; it was eight percent. So, like, if that you know that speaks to the to the journey. Um, so I, uh, I, all of the change has been great and positive. I'm really, uh, I'm really excited about, you know, what the future holds for, uh, uh, for the organization. We've, um, you know, we're, we've been doing a lot to make sure that we are recruiting and retaining uh, all kind, you know, diversity, and I mean diversity in the largest sense sense of the word, uh, and then that you know, that we retain that talent. And we know from one of the underrepresented. Uh, studies that Rand did for us that women leave the service at a greater rate than than men, kind of at each point. So there's just this delta that grows uh, into the into the senior rank. So there are other women uh, serving in the flag corps right now, but but it's certainly not 40 percent, right? And so this 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 is the journey that we need to need to continue on as an organization to make sure that one it, that it's a uh, that that women see opportunity and that they um, you know that the lifestyle and the profession appeals to them, and then you know make sure that that the diversity they bring is valued, and we give them a meaningful work. And uh, I, uh, I talk a lot about diversity and inclusion. Right? This is this it's called it's it's really at the end of the day, it's about the cultural respect that we have, and it is literally an every person, every day activity that uh, that we need to gauge in. I um I wouldn't still be in uniform if I didn't think it was a pretty incredible uh, service, but uh. But I also don't take for granted that if we uh, if we let our eye off that ball, we uh, we we could potentially slip backward, and that's not going to be okay. Thanks. I was on the Secretary of the Navy's advisory panel for for eight years, and one of the most revolutionary things we did was to uh, improve the Navy's parental leave policy because one of the keys to retention is not making it difficult for people to to have and raise children. And so what we did, and, and, and uh, the secretary got in trouble with the sec def at the time, is we sort of went beyond DOD. And um, it was a very smart investment. So I will, if I may, with your permission, I'd like to connect the leadership of Elsie Wins to you because they, I'm sure they, you, you would enjoy um, knowing one another. I have one final question and then I'm gonna, and this is a hard one because I'm mixing up COVID-19, recruitment and retention, not only because of COVID-19, longer deployments to very, very, you know, far-flung corners of the globe. There's, there's a lot going on. Um, and I'm curious how, you know, uh, how you're, you're, you feel about recruitment and retention given these, these serious uh, challenges that you're confronting. 
All right, boy, you just unpacked a lot there. Um, so <laughs> COVID-19 has, um, has just been um, exceptionally challenging to uh, lead through and uh, manage as an, you know, as a military force and a, and a military and a, an operational force for the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, it's not like this came with a playbook, right? The last time as a nation we dealt with it was in 1918, and most of those lessons have been forgotten or wouldn't necessarily have applied. So it, um, everything has been impacted for the last year. So uh, we, from a recruitment standpoint, we continue to operate Cape May, which is our uh, enlisted accession point. Initially, the, the capacity was significantly reduced we're working, we're working back up towards uh, full capacity, particularly as the vaccines come online and the, and the force is getting vaccinated. It's, you know, it's just helping, um, you know, kind of free up some of the, some of the movements that we need to do within the training system. But um, there will be an impact. Uh, we are still getting people willing to get on the bus and come to Cape May. The problem is we haven't had the throughput, so there will be an impact of frontline units with regard to non-rate shortages that it's gonna take us some time uh, to come to come through. From a retention standpoint, you know, you talk about the deployments. So the standard for the large ships is no more than 185 days away from home port, but that's still a long time. And we uh, we had we've we've conducted 26 ish or so uh, deployments over the last year. You know, the large ships and and some of the smaller ones. And, uh, you know, job one has been mission assurance and operational readiness. And, you know, initially uh, that looked like we basically put the, put the crew on the cutter, they put their lines off and they went offshore and they soaked for two weeks. And that went okay for us for a little while. Then, um, you know, then we got smarter, the N95 mask, at home uh, ROM or restriction of maneuver. Uh, that got us a little further. And, and now I, uh, Boy, the vaccine has been game changing uh, on a on a number of different fronts. We've got the you know uh, we just sailed uh, Stratton into the bearing a couple of weeks ago. She was ninety eight percent vaccinated. I think there was only one crew member that uh, that chose not not to be vaccinated or wasn't able to. So that just that that has been liberating. It allows the crew to have liberty. There hasn't been liberty in the last year. You know, it used to be part of the fun of the East Pack is you pull into a foreign port. And you're able to go to one of the all-inclusive resorts, you know, get off, get off the ship, have a little bit of downtime. Uh, that had not been going on. We're, we're, we're finding creative ways to create that. Because if we don't make it fun to be at sea, people won't join the seagoing service. And we've talked, we spent a lot of time talking about sea duty attractiveness. Because when, you know, I've talked about the national security cutters, the polar security cutters, as the offshore patrol cutter comes online, the FRCs, it's about 2,700 new at sea billets that we're going to have as an organization. If we don't get it right, we're, we're not going to have people to um, operate operate the ships. And so it's been, um, you know, it's just it. The senior leadership we have spent a lot of time talking about that, and um, you know, again, make, making it. Uh, fun and attractive for, uh, for folks to come into the service to, again, you know, seize that opportunity and then get to do some really, uh, you know, fun, fun stuff that was made a little less fun, um, in the COVID environment, but, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're pivoting back to, uh, my, I have a sense of urgency to normalize as much as we can, as we, you know, again, get vaccinated and start to start to pivot, pivot back. Like, I fear that, uh, as a nation, we're, we're still a ways away from it feeling like it did, you know, March a March a year ago, but uh, uh, we have a we have an obligation to serve the American public, and you know we've not we've not missed a beat in the Eastern Pacific, you know, in the Arctic deployments, the search and rescue, uh, all of the things that we do to um, you know provide for homeland security and ensure our economic well being has has gone on. It's just been been a little bit harder this past year. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to. Um, um, um turn to the questions and I'll, I'll just, uh, they've been submitted in writing. So um, the first one is, is, uh, is from Ambassador Nina Hachigian. And, and I was hoping she would ask one because Ambassador Hachigian was ambassador to ASEAN. So she had a very close relationship when she was in Jakarta with a lot of your partner nations and, and others. 
And um, what Ambassador Hertigian is asking is the trawling and other illegal harvesting in the South China Sea, artificial island building, mostly by China, really has caused incredible damage to the point where it isn't clear that fisheries can, can bounce back. Um, what are your thoughts about solutions to the, this ongoing series of problems? And I'm just gonna sneak down, and then there's a PS. Um, <laughs> you'll, I like this, Ambassador Hachigian. P.S. I have thought for some time that we ought to double the budget of the Coast Guard. <laughs> Somebody who was at the State Department. So this is a person of great wisdom. She's the deputy <laughs> mayor of Los Angeles for international member of my board. So she is my boss. And um, so thank you, Nina. Yeah, thanks. No, I'm, yeah, I, I support that. Yeah, if you need my vote on doubling the Coast Guard budget, I'm, I'm in. Um, yeah, that's a whole a whole other conversation. Some of the budget challenge, and uh, you know, you mentioned ASEAN, right? I the way forward is to, um, you know, to again increase this this network, right? So there are parts of the world where we've got some really pretty good regionally RFMOs, regional fisheries management organizations, but there's other parts where those don't exist, and so you know, finding. Uh, coalitions of the willing uh, in regions is really going to be critical. And so while, you know, we published the strategy and are hoping to provide some, um, you know, focus and leadership to it, um, these, these regional initiatives will, will be the strongest and best led by countries in, in the, the region. We can bring in expertise and, you know, sort of capacity and training to help um, and, you know, so I didn't talk about the um, uh, North Pacific uh, Coast Guard Forum, but, you know, I mentioned the bilaterals with China and Russia. So, you know, that that's an example of a regional forum. It's Canada, Japan, South Korea, Russia, China, U.S., uh, where we where we meet annually, you know, we talk about search and rescue. We talk about fisheries. And then every summer there is an on water operation called North Pacific Guard where um, you know, the level of participation is a little out of balance, but, uh, you know, the U.S., we always send a, send, uh, a ship. Uh, the Canadians usually provide a plane. Japan allows uh, landing rights, right? So that it's, it's um, you know, kind of a multinational approach to uh, countering some of the problem. The first summer I got here, uh, we, we still at that point had Chinese fish riders that uh, that agreement has expired, but um, we uh, we boarded uh, the Run Dot, a high you know high seas drift net operation, well in violation of the uh, the the standards, and uh, that vessel uh, was you know escorted back, uh, went into China, and I I don't I don't know the status of the vessel. I think the master is still in in jail, but so it's it's an example of the kind of um, really mul multilateral approaches that are that are going to be just just critical uh, to this to this mission space, and that is, you know, I talked about the the bilaterals uh, that we've got in the you know with many of the South and Central American countries, and uh, looking to you know expand those to include fishing uh, becomes a step, and then um, you know helping identify uh, you know how regional fisheries management organizations might uh, might be established to again just bring you know bring some coherence. Uh, regionally, because it's not this. Is, there's no one country that can uh, counter this this threat. It's going to have to be kind of a, a full uh, full pronged approach. And thanks for the uh, the vote of confidence on a larger Coast Guard budget. Well, also Ali Mayorkas, the Secretary of Homeland Security. He's from LA. He's one of our members. He's uh, he's a local guy. So next time we see him, we'll tell him. <laughs> uh, Nina said double the budget, and uh, <laughs> hard to say no to. I've got a couple of questions from Jordan Reimer, who is at the Rand Corporation, and Jordan actually studies the issues that we're talking about today. So um, the first one is, uh, what, what's the human dimension of IUU? It's his understanding there's involuntary servitude on IUU ships. Are we, you know, we being the Coast Guard, tackling that? Um, his other question is, um, what are we doing on the strategic operational level to tackle issues, you know, flags of convenience, untraceable ownership. I mean, this is a major national security issue in terms of smuggling people, in terms of smuggling oil, smuggling uh, drugs. And then um, Meg Caldwell asks a very similar question about the, the, the sort of human rights um, dimension of, of uh, 
of IUU. Um, you know, human rights abuses at sea, um, having to do with the IUU, you know, um, uh, project are human rights a priority for for us? Us again being the Coast Guard. Yeah, so that's a that's a great question, and right, you know, I keep talking about uh, the you know forming a network to counter this illicit network, uh, illuminating the network, because the reality is so what, you know we're talking in the context of uh, IUUF, and there is evidence right that that there are uh, you know there is a human uh, dimension that you know in indentured servitude and others. Uh, where you know um, some folks are forced to sea on these fishing vessels and then um, are unable to return home for you know long, long periods of time, not being paid, working in poor conditions. So um, you know, as uh, like the North Pacific Guard, as we uh, do the training for our our boarding teams, right? There, there, there is an element where we talk about the things to to look for. Uh, if you know, we may suspect that um, there's uh, some some kind of you know human uh, uh, human dimension to it. Um, so yeah, it's important. Uh, but again, you know, uh, it, getting getting on board, doing the boarding, is really becomes a um, you know a, a step from a um, sort of the strategic level. You know, flags of convenience. Um, you know, generally from a flag of convenience as uh, the you know as commercial ships uh, provide notice to come to the United States and you know, this is anything from a small chemical tanker up through you know the big you know Marisk and Costco uh, ships um, they you know those are all vetted by the Coast Guard they've got to provide a 96 hour uh, prior you know 96 hours prior to arrival is a fair significant vetting process then um, so the at least for the the things that are inbound to the U.S., I you know we've we've got a pretty good system that you know prevents you from being surprised uh, by an unknown known, known threat vector. But not every country has those same protocols. So right, so there there are definitely kind of blind spots where where this illicit network, and so it's not just fish or drugs or people. It's all it's all of that, and it's money and it's weapons. Uh, you know, anywhere you've you've got a criminal network, they will exploit it for for their own uh, ends. And you know, we uh, sort of the good guys need to uh, you know get get inside of that de decision loop. Often, right, and where we're not all that good is following the money. Often, the money illuminates um, quite a bit. Uh, which is why I really, if you've not seen this New York Times info video on the um, you know North Korea fuel. That that's exactly what they do is they they use a number of different uh, national technical means and sources to illuminate that network. It's not just about seeing the two ships side by side doing the transfer. They unpack all of the uh, business elements and the shipping uh, shipping companies in, involved in it in a in a really uh, powerful way. And so th there's also so there's the video thing. There's also a um, a short article by the uh, uh, the, you know, the two people that did the research talking about the research technology, it took them about 10 months to put this, uh, put it together. But I, for, for me, it's just, it, it's a, it's a perfect example of this kind of illuminate the network. And then we, you know, bring um, whole government uh, against it. And we shouldn't be too beholden to the problems, right? You know, drugs, bad, we can agree, illegal fishing, bad, we can agree. But a lot of this is, is happening across an illicit network uh, that uh, we just we need to uh, become more more nimble and uh, and responsive to. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, the Consul General from Bangladesh would like to ask a question. He'd like to ask it um, verbally. So, uh, Marissa, um, Mr. Consul General, over to you, sir. Uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Green, and thank you, Admiral Linda Fagan. Um, that was very informative. Uh, I just want to uh, make some quick points. Uh, Bangladesh is, uh, by land, it's not a very big country, but uh, recently, um, because of international judicial process and negotiation with our neighbors, uh, uh, Myanmar and India, we have got uh, like um, 118,000 square kilometer of ocean. So it, it's a quite a bit of land. It's like uh, about 60% of, of our land mass. So now we are uh, challenged uh, with... Um, uh, with the management of these resources. And uh, we are putting an emphasis, uh, focusing on the uh, concepts of, of, of blue economy, 
And um, uh, also you might be, uh, you might have noted that the State Department recently um, uh, regarded Bangladesh as an important country from the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy uh, point of view. Uh, what we uh, really uh, uh, want to uh, have uh, in terms of collaboration from countries like the United States of America is to view us independently uh, of, of, from a specific point of view, um, uh, country by country, because the country's needs are different. Uh, of course, uh, we, we are partner countries, we help each other, that, that's fine, but we have got our own uh, specific needs. And uh, on, in terms of IUU, we, we do have this problem and other associated problems as the Admiral has been mentioning, like uh, smuggling and uh, people and, and, and other things, drugs and et cetera, um, uh, in, in, in the open sea. Uh, my question is, how does America help us uh, in, in terms of building um, collaboration uh, uh, in the areas that we need, particularly capacity building? Um, there's some bunch of technical terms that I have to read out from the, from the paper. Um, like uh, fish detecting technology, either through satellite or sonar, and um, maritime surveillance boats. Bang uh, USA has given us some that has improved our uh, maritime security, but we would definitely want some more. Uh, and pollution uh, in, in the sea and uh, in the biotech, marine biotechnology area, like value addition of underutilized materials, processing by products, raw materials, uh, such as seaweed, developing new raw materials of CE, uh, seaweed, bioprospecting, bioactive ingredient, uh, ingredients, and so on. So I guess uh, there should be a mechanism to do that, how to go about it. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much for your excellent question. Admiral, over to you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. And uh, you know, so to your point that each nation needs to be viewed individually, I could not agree more. Um, and one of the, it's just, some of the travel that I had the opportunity to do before COVID into the region um, really highlighted for me just the 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 vast uh, differences in uh, you know where where nations are whether it's from uh, you know a governance standpoint and having you know laws that you know that allow the kinds of activity that are that are necessary for enforcement. Uh, to you know capacity and whether it's small boats or larger boats or people expertise right I, you you can pretty much I mean every country's in a slightly different uh, position and I you know I, one of the real value propositions to the U.S. Coast Guard is I think we do a really good job at driving into a conversation so that it's helpful to you not us coming and saying hey we can do x y and z and you saying, but that's not what I want. I want A, B, and, and C. And I we do I I believe we do a really good job of kind of dialing in on uh, what a nation may need. You know, so somebody it may be that you need um, uh, small engine repair expertise, or uh, a training team to come in and help teach boarding officers how to do fisheries boardings or law enforcement boardings. So our uh, Office of International Affairs out of uh, you know, Coast Guard headquarters in DC uh, coordinates a lot of that uh, for us. And we can definitely help, um, uh, you know, help connect so that you can kind of get a sense for the types of things that uh, you know, we, we would be able to engage on in a way that I think is gonna be you know, significant and, uh, and meaningful. So it, it, for us, this is, this is you know, again, finding common, common ground, like-minded, partners across the region, um, you know, one of our challenges as a, as an organization is just, you know, there is not, there's just not enough to go around. I, you know, I talked quite a bit about the national security cutters and the, and the big ships that we've projected in the region, but uh, I think it might be interesting for, uh, for all of you to know that we're, uh, we have three fast response cutters that we're going to base in Guam, which, uh, you know, kind of gets us over a little closer to the region. Now, they're, they're 154 feet uh, they're not, you know, the larger ships, but they're not like the patrol boats that we've replaced, um, that, you know, we replaced with them. And so we've, we've done some things with uh, our, uh, with the 225 foot cutters, which are a little more capable and carry more stores. And we push uh, we'll cut SAGs or surface action groups, you know, into Oceania, into, uh, into regions and areas that we've not uh, been able to create much, uh, much presence in before. And so I, I'm super excited about those three FRCs in Guam. And I think we've, we will, we will have the ability to explore 
you know, exactly the kinds of engagements and, uh, and opportunities that you're talking about and beyond, you know, our international affairs folks can help uh, with it. There's a, there's a whole menu. It's like going into a fast food store and ordering of, you know, training and different, uh, right, right down to, uh, we've got a model maritime code that can help uh, countries uh, put together the kind of legislation that might be needed if it's, uh, if it's absent. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, and one final question, um, and this is, is from Professor Robert English, and um, Seth Stoddard is asking, if, if, who served at, at, at Homeland Security before, and my guess is will again someday, ask a very similar question, which is about, it, it, I'm just going to read Professor English's version because it's, it's, he puts it better than I would. Commercial fishing is currently banned in the Arctic. But as climate warms and ice recedes, the pressure from Asian fleets could grow intense, particularly if we see fisheries migration or even collapse. Are you optimistic that the Arctic Five, including uh, Russia, can cooperate in combating illegal fishing, co coordinated patrols, and so forth? And then Seth, in his question, basically says, is the area, I guess he's with Nina Hachigian, is the Coast Guard adequately resourced for this? And if not, what's the plan for ensuring the Coast Guard has adequate resources to handle this increasing um, workload? And he mentioned your your budget as well. So you have at least two people that want to double your budget. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I believe I would like to believe I'm an optimist. I'm not. So fisheries, you know, it's it's a it's a commons problem, and, and it it is now, and it only gets harder as. Uh, again, you know, sea temperature change shifts migratory patterns of the fish. That uh, that is a reality that we just need to, um, you know, understand to the extent that we can. And again, this is, uh, you know, improving our ability to, you know, illuminate where where those fleets are and what kind of patterns that they are uh, op operating in are going to be be absolutely uh, critical. Uh, with the with the building and commissioning of the polar security cutters, uh, I, I am optimistic that we will have a, a more enduring presence in you know again our uh, kind of Western Arctic than than what we've uh, had in the past. I can't because I've not had the opportunity to engage with um, you know many of the other members of the Arctic Council. I, I can't really speak to what and how they're. Uh, resource and kind of what some of their planning is for moving ahead, right? Because so wherever you are on the science of this, there's just a whole lot more water availability up there. Just that less ice, more water, uh, the season's expanding. Um, and beyond fish, you're just seeing increased human activity up there. The, um, you know, the cruise industry has been on a knee for a year, but at some point that will come back. And we were, before COVID, we were on pace to have a record-breaking year for cruise ship transits. Uh, you know, up into the Arctic and through the Northwest Passage. All of that we need to be thinking about and, um, you know, posture ourselves for as a nation. So I, um, so I've talked a lot about the Polish security cutters and General Robinson, you know, she was Northcom commander. And, uh, you know, if she went on, she would say, well, there's, you know, there are enablers as a nation that we need to invest in, right? So there's a broader conversation beyond the Coast Guard and our Coast Guard icebreakers to the, to the answer to the question, right? What are the, what are the comms infrastructure? How do we invest in uh, the satellites so that they're optimized uh, over the pole as opposed to the way they're optimized over the equator now, right? So Healy spent 30 days out of comms in her operations up there this summer because we, we don't have the, the um, uh, you know, communications infrastructure to raid in a way that provides for reliable communications. What's our forward operating base going to be? How are we going to resupply ships with regularity up there? What, what, is that, what does that footprint look like? Those are national conversations that we need to be having uh, with urgency that go well beyond, uh, you know, the Coast Guard budget and um, uh, some of the, the new ships that we're building. And, you know, we're focused on the people to run those ships so that we've got, you know, the workforce, the professionalism, the skill set to run them. Um, but there, there are a couple other big pieces that we're, uh, we're going to need to get after, you know. So fish is, it, that, that pressure is coming at us, as is many other uh, of the human activities that we're going to, um, you know, conduct as, uh, as the waterways uh, open up up there. Thanks. And well, thank you so much. I mean, this final question really highlights the indispensability of the Coast Guard as a partner to so many agencies and so many um, parts, not only of the Department of Defense, but the United States government writ large. Let me thank you again for taking time to meet with us. Let me wish you well in your work. Let me wish your daughter a greater career as her mom has had. 
And um, we, 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 the Coast Guard never lets the Pacific Council down. So yet again, we thank you for, for being such a, a good partner and, and, and for all that you do. And I want to thank all of our folks on the call today for, for joining us as well. All right. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, everyone. Thank I you. Uh, really Thank appreciate you joining us and uh, you know, the opportunity to talk uh, a little bit about the, the Coast Guard. Thanks for all that you do to uh, support us. Thank you. Take care.